Today uh, on our farm walk series, we're gonna talk about outdoor growing and covered growing in the winter. So particularly cold weather growing. So we're gonna cover uh, the structures we use, uh, how we use them, interior covers, and we're gonna focus on the big three, which is ventilation, water use and control, and temperature control. So as we go around the farm today, those are the big three that we'll talk about, and I hope you find this series useful. <laughs> well, hi everybody. My name's Anna Meadows, and behind the camera's Anna Withers. Um, we're kind of in a transitionary period where we're both outreach coordinators with the Springfield Community Gardens. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the Springfield Community Gardens is a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri. Um, we have a network of 18 community gardens around town that are neighborhood gardens, and then also a farm incubator program with four, four urban farm sites, also within city limits. Um, and our vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And so we do that through both of those programs as well as uh, community education, uh, like this series, this Farm Walk series in partnership with Millsap Farms and uh, MU Extension. Um, so we're happy you're here and we're happy to be partnering with the Millsap. So thanks for having us out. Thank you. So um, we'll, we'll just give you the brief rundown of the numbers on the farm. So um, Sarah and I have been here 14 years, almost coming up on 15 years. Um, we didn't grow up farming. We were, uh, we, we grew up, both of us in town, uh, me in Springfield, Missouri, Sarah in Lakewood, Colorado. And um, we became interested in farming kids through the wilderness and through the outdoors and so on. And so uh, that's what we had been, really thought we were gonna do together uh, when we met and, and married. And then, um, then it kind of morphed into us having a farm with 10 kids, which is a lot like what we thought we were gonna do. It's just a different way of doing that. Uh, so we've now been here, like I said, about almost 15 years, and in that time we've gone from uh, about a, I think our first garden was about a half acre market garden, and then we had, uh, we did pasture poultry uh, for a few years, and we did some goats, and we even had a couple cows at some point. What else? Uh, we, well, we had, we had, at our peak, I think we did about a thousand meat birds a year, we did about turkeys, 400 turkeys. turkeys, we had, oh, isn't it nice that we're not harvesting turkeys this week? <laughs> um, and we did um, uh, we, our vegetables vegetable growing has expanded uh, at one point we were up to seven acres uh, done very badly I might add um, and then we shrunk back down in 2012 to about two acres and we have very slightly increased from that but not a lot I think I, I tried to measure it this fall on Google Maps and kind of get a so I, I came up with right around two and a half acres that we really are farming, but um, of that, about uh, a third is under cover. So something around uh, 30,000 square feet under cover, a little more than that. So, so that's what we'll see a lot of today, but, um, but we'll also talk a little bit about field production in the winter uh, as well. So um, what we're gonna talk about today in general is growing in the cold. And so, um, you know, it depends on your interest. If you're, I mean, I hear flowers are, are an interest and then of course vegetables, um, we do both of those and we do them pretty much year round. I mean, there's, there's really never a week that we don't have vegetables that can be harvested and sold. There are uh, weeks we take off. So for example, we'll be off from Thanksgiving until the following Monday. I guess that's not a week, is it? Uh, but we take off the week between Christmas and New Year's as well. And uh, even then, of course, there's things to be tended, but there's no harvesting. But all the rest of the week, so by, you know, say 50 weeks out of the year, we are uh, seeding, transplanting, uh, harvesting, and selling produce and flowers as well. Uh, we, take a, we take a longer break on flowers. We take a break on flowers from, the, from usually Christmas to um, whenever our first February flowers come in. I mean, we're aiming for, for Valentine's Day, of course, but <laughs> you know, aiming with the seasons is a tricky deal. So. We'll talk a little bit about that, how, how we're thinking about that this time of year. Um, we did talk uh, quite a bit about planning last month, so that isn't necessarily my intended to be my focus, although I'm glad that, like I said, you, know, you, guys, you guys are the students in the audience and the sharers, so uh, I, I'd like to hear what you're interested in, and I also want to hear your experiences, and then uh, hopefully out of that we all get smarter. No, we get more educated. <laughs> probably unlikely to make us more smarter. <laughs> At this point. <laughs> I mean, we probably got all the smarts we're going to get. Uh, but anyway, we're, we'll, uh, yeah, so we'll let that uh, be shaped by what you're interested in. But my, my approach today was to talk about 
uh, how we grow in the winter, uh, the, the actual physical realities of it. So how do we, what levels of protection do we use? How do we think about that? What considerations, so for example, the big three for me in winter growing is uh, water management, uh, ventilation, and managing covers. So how are we going to, you know, what, what level of cover are we going to supply? Uh, which is also could be said as temperature management. She's coming to get these two bags of corn. They're really heavy. Oh, heavy. Hmm. So with the two acres you have, I mean, how many people are involved in I have 22 people on payroll right now. It oh. might be a little excessive. Um, several of those are my kids. One of them is my eight-year-old son who earns $30 a month. Boy, he earns that every day, though. I mean, I'm telling you. Like, he drove the tractor for three hours yesterday. So he's oh, wow. I'm not even kidding. Like, he's actually, he, he, he gets a raise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he gets a raise. Yeah. Um, but, uh, of course, he would pay me to do that as well. So, <laughs> not that I want to take advantage of it, but I'm realizing, like at this point in his life, that is like, whew, boy, that's that's pretty special stuff. Um, so yeah, but but uh, on a daily basis in the in the in the summertime, uh, we have uh, four or five full-time workers, and then we'll usually have our uh, hourly part-time that come in two or three days a week, and we usually got four of those. So I don't know that comes out you know, somewhere around uh, six people full-time equivalent, uh, maybe seven in the summertime. And then we taper it down a little bit in the fall and winter. Uh, we try not to, we try and keep people employed, but also be wise about our finances. Um, but yeah, it's, it takes a ton of people to make this thing work. Now, that said, uh, right now we are at uh, that, that really big number, um, and we're paying for it payroll-wise. We have at times run a much leaner operation and farmed the same amount of land with fewer people. And I think there's several things that were different about that, but the main one is the experience level of the crew. So right now, the only people that have been farming for more than a year and a half or two years here are uh, myself and Kimby, and of course Sarah. Sarah is, um, she's mostly involved in teaching the kids and doing all the other stuff that needs to be done that, that isn't directly farm work. So, um, so that's what I'm getting at is that I think you know, the more mature the crew is in terms of understanding what needs to happen, how to do it, and uh, Kimby and I were talking about that yesterday, that, you know, if, when, when you can say to a crew member, uh, we're gonna, we need to prep that bed and put the gladiolas in it, we're gonna, we're gonna mow, lay down cardboard, put down a, three inches of compost, set out the gladiolas on six by six spacing, six rows wide, and cover over with two feet of mulch. Ideally, you can tell the crew that, and then it just gets done. And you walk away and yeah, stuff. and I don't have a crew that can do that right now because they don't um, they don't have enough experience. They don't uh, have you know the, the tractor operating skills and there's several pieces that are missing there. So, uh, but you can so that what that means then in terms of time is that that means a lot of time me going back and forth and checking or just me sitting there and being part of it. I mean not sitting, but you know maybe I'm the tractor operator that day, which is fine. But I've got you know 16 other things that have to get done that day as well that. That are higher order that I don't really ever anticipate teaching somebody to do, like fixing the propane heater in the greenhouse. You know, well, I probably don't need to train a farmhand on how to do that. That's probably an okay task for me to do because it comes up every other year. You know. So anyway, that's kind of the that's that maybe mm -hmm. more than you're asking, but um, I I feel like what we do could probably be done by four really skilled and experienced people on two and a half acres. It might be more appropriate for it to be four, uh, five or six. But that said, you know, uh, Kimby and I both are able to take uh, vacation time. Um, we, we anticipate taking something between four and six weeks of vacation a year. And uh, Sarah and I definitely do that every year. Kimby doesn't always do her vacation time. But she does, she enjoys other perks, like she takes one day a week off. And she's, um, it, we're, we're very, very flexible. So if somebody has something going on, couple of years they did pottery class one one afternoon a week and, and that sort of thing is kind of the other way we think of our time so, yeah. which is all to say that we've created a lifestyle that we're all pretty happy with we just there's always little tweaks to make so, yeah. Good. Um, so any other questions before we start to walk it's a beautiful day finally we win yes. the weather, right? <laughs> so, sun's out. Great. 
Um, so we'll step into the greenhouse and we'll uh, we'll visit about it's levels of protection. Yeah, supposed to be on for four hours. Um, why don't you guys step right down there, and I'll I'll come around the other side for us to see. It. All right. Well, this is the time of year when things get pretty sparse in here on the seedling table, but this is where about uh, 70 or more percent of our plants start. So we do some direct seeding, but it's a pretty small amount compared to the, the amount of transplanting we do. And that's an important part to me of growing in the winter because um, in the winter time, of course, everything's going to slow down. It's got shorter day length uh, and shorter and less less heat. You know, plants don't really photosynthesize below about 50 degrees typically. So until the you know some some days it may never get above 50 degrees, and other days it may only be above 50 degrees for an hour or two. And so, as we um, as that slowdown happens, if we're doing things like you know seeding lettuce out in the greenhouse, uh, I mean out in the outside, uh, uh, the unheated greenhouse. That's what I'm trying to say. Then we're just going to be it's going to be forever before those things are ready. Um, same thing with flowers. You know, we've got our this is a uh, these are uh, oh darn it. I was going to look smart. And tell you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember now. You can say it anyway. We'll yeah, yeah. These are companionate. No, they're not. Actually. I know better than that. Um, these are tiny babies. Um, we would certainly have a higher loss rate than what we're going to have from these. So, so that's that's one way to think of it. Oh, scabiosa. I got it. Here we go. <laughs> now, this is heated, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, but heat. right now, it's this is just solar heat that we're feeling. Yeah, there's oh, nothing wow. additional right now. There's a propane heater that was set at 43 degrees, kept at 43 overnight. So this is, we're probably, what, 70, 75 in here right now. So. Yeah, this is the warmest I have felt in a few weeks, it feels like. <laughs> That's right. So this is one of the really joys of winter growing, you know, is in your greenhouses. You've got eternal spring in your greenhouse. In fact, sometimes it's eternal summer. Um, mm -hmm. What's the lowest that it might get? In here. That's a great question. So, so that's... Uh, and that, that actually, Anna, gets at the, the sort of categories of protection that we talk about. So this is the always above freezing greenhouse. So we heat it enough to make sure it, oh, it never freezes in here. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is plant growth. Another is that I've got so much exposed water pipe and, and uh, you know, other water systems in here that a freeze is pretty devastating. Um, we dealt with that for the first few years. We used to let it get colder in here. And then we realized it's really not worth the cost of like spending two days fixing pipes at the at, you know in the spring, so uh, we just keep it minimally heated. So we've got a big wooden furnace, or wood, it's not a wooden furnace, it's a wood burning furnace. There you go. Different thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, down here we've got a backup wood stove down here, and we've got a propane heater over there. For years we just had a, a, a wood furnace. In fact, if you want, we can step over there and I'll well, explain. Well, you're here. You have the hot water. Oh yeah, and I should also explain that. So this water heater right here is the is the last uh, heating element in here, and this circulates hot water. So this uh, this manifold that you see here, mm -hmm. so it's it's two pipes leading out into the spaghetti tubing, and the spaghetti tubing goes down, it loops back, it goes all the way down there, and then it comes back to this manifold. So it comes out and back. And it comes out at, this is uh, ideally around 120 degrees, uh, maybe maybe 110. And uh, it runs uh, on a thermostat. And it, in the springtime, we'll turn this up so that the, so that the soil temperature we're trying to maintain is around 70. Uh, that's really a nice way to do it because if you have warm soil and cold tops, um, cold air temperatures, then you get nice stocky plants with big root systems. Um, if you have the opposite, if you have hot air and cool soil, then you get the opposite, which is kind of wimpy root systems with big fleshy tops. And then when you transplant those things out, they're just not uh, near, nearly as vigorous as they will be the other way around. So, um, so I really like bottom heat. That's, that's the term for this, uh, generic term for this system. Um, this one in particular is a biotherm, uh, but it, it predates me by, uh, this, this system is probably as old as me. I think it was 
looking at the records, I would say it was bought in the mid '70s, maybe early '80s. Um, and uh, so, so we we bought the greenhouse with the system, but I have disassembled it, you know, worked through it and, and rebuilt it a couple of times. Uh, but it's pretty pretty amazing, very very effective in terms of growth, um, to the degree that when we use it. The first year we had it, so we had it sitting in a corner for several years, really not knowing the value of it, as you, know, as you do. And so uh, finally we, we said, oh, that, that looks like something we should mess with. We read a little bit about it and, and talked to some other growers. And so I hooked it up. And that, that spring it took three weeks less grow time to get our tomatoes to the size we wanted to transplant. Wow. Um, and that's with, you know, it's, it's not free. I mean, we're using propane heat to do it. but but that propane only costs us maybe two hundred dollars. So, like, oh yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good math. I mean, if I can pay two hundred dollars and move my tomato transplants back three weeks into the season, that's that's really really nice. So, because that means I don't have to heat the rest. Don't have to think about heating the rest of the greenhouse, you know, significantly until um, until that uh, end of end of January is kind of our time frame nowadays. So you would have tomato plants ready to go in the ground? So I will, uh, I'd like to get my tomato, my first tomato plants go in the ground the middle of March, 15th of March. Are they under cover? Yeah. The middle? yeah. Mm -hmm. They're under cover. So stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, definitely a high time. You can ask when the first yeah. ones we put in the outside, right? Yeah, That's outside. Like we don't push the, that, that much anymore. Yeah, we go around the 1st of May on our outside okay. tomatoes. Right. Uh, we do some outside squash a lot earlier than that. Sometimes we'll do outside squash at the end of March. But sometimes that works, sometimes it really doesn't. Right. It's, that's a that's a gamble. Yeah, exactly. um, but when it works, it's lovely because then you have squash on May, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in general, uh, we, we're looking at we start our successions of tomatoes the 15th of March in unheated greenhouse. Well, we'll call it minimally heated greenhouse. They have some propane heaters that I move in there, um, but they're not permanently mounted. And then I've got uh, then we'll then we'll do a, a batch, a, another batch in unheated greenhouses in the middle of April, and then we'll do another batch um, around the 1st of May to the 15th of May, somewhere in there, and then we'll do our last round of, of tomatoes, uh, field planted tomatoes in usually mid-June, and those are our you know, August, September tomatoes. So, uh, also in the greenhouse? I mean, those, those the last round will be outside. outside. Well, uh, no, actually, this last couple years we've been playing around with a very, very last round. And those were Romas because the Romas are super disease resistant and they do really well in that really late slot. And those actually went in the ground even later. Those were, um, I think we planted those the first of July this year. And they've been they've been really nice. I mean, we harvested the last of them. Well, we were actually looking at them this morning and trying to decide whether we should try and harvest them one more time. They got pretty handled by that last frost. I think they're going to be gone. There's going to be another one later. Yeah, to, tomorrow night, right? Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the part of being um, having a successful farm is definitely being ready to cut your losses and say that's not working Squaw, uh, uh, melons is another one we, no, we, we tried to grow every melons. melon you can imagine and uh, I love melons I, I, it's one of my favorite summer foods it's one of my favorite foods just yeah. anything mm -hmm. but um, we've had so many nice patches of melons that died right before the melons ripened uh, from usually bacterial wilt from cucumber beetles and Sometimes if, those, if they don't get in, then it's the, the squash bugs, and if the squash bugs don't get them, then maybe you get a vine borer. It's just, there's always something, right? Powdery mildew. And um, I have yet to meet anybody who grows a lot of melons successfully organically in the Ozarks. That's a lot of qualifiers. So I yeah. think someday I'll find somebody who has enough of those that, you know, if I can find somebody who grows them successfully organically in, say, North Carolina or Virginia or something, then I would at least be emboldened to try again. But... I, I don't know. We don't have that kind of pest control or disease control right now, and so I'm, I'm not sure what that's about. So we had to back away from that. Um, and, but others we picked back up. Uh, for example, sweet potatoes. For several years we had a lot of sweet potato problems, and uh, now we look at back at it and realize a lot of it was uh, there were some watering issues. There was some organic matter in the soil issues, and not enough. Um, we had some um, we had some problems with slip production. We weren't making growing our own slips, and so we were at the mercy of the shippers as to when they sent us slips and um, we've solved those problems and this year we harvested insane amounts of sweet potatoes and, and we don't see any reason to slow down on that it's really so have you ever found that if you stop a crop for a few years 
that can sometimes take care of the problem, like if it's pests. Or yeah, like it that. does help. Yeah. And I mean, there's, but that's kind of a tricky thing, right? Like, I mean, if if your solution is you can only grow melons every ten years, right. well, that's better than not growing them at all. But man, you'll there's really gotta be a better them. way, right? Yeah. You'll enjoy them that. Time. I mean, boy, won't that? It's like the jubilee year for melon. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I think so, definitely, and and a great example of that would be um, uh, that uh, field cucumbers would be an example where for years we we had, well the first two years that Sarah and I grew here, we just had abundant cucumbers and uh, out of the field, just no problem at all. And um, you'd start harvesting them in June and they'd go all the way to frost and, and just bushels and bushels of cucumbers off these plants. And then the cucumber beetles showed up. And before that, we just didn't really see them much. Um, squash bugs and, and uh, powdery mildew and all that stuff. Well, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that if we were to go out into new land, you know, a mile from here, and establish a cucumber patch, we could probably do that for a, two years. So maybe there's a system that I, like that that would kind of work, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, I think if you plant it, they will find it. Uh, eventually, eventually, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they have super sensitive whatever it is that gets yeah. into those things. And those squash and those bugs things, are right? coming every year, whether you plant or not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. That's right. Yeah, I don't think we ever had no squash bugs. Yeah. But I definitely see the populations uh, rise and fall year to year as well. So this was not a particularly bad cucumber beetle year. Um, no. They were, at least for us, they were better than usual. Um, turns out, by the way, cucumber beetles don't just eat cucumbers. They also yeah. love to dine on your zinnias, sunflowers. Um, what's the other big one that we get? So we get so oh, dahlias, so aggravated with them. Um, go on beans, no, not too early. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there's yeah, the cucumber beetles are oh lettuce. They like lettuce too. Oh. I give them a lecture every time I find them on lettuce. What do you guys think you do? They're squash bugs. You hear? But they don't. I absolutely do, yeah, yeah. In fact, let's, let's walk. I want to show you some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. That's, that is a, a very promising approach. I think, I mean, realistically, I, I don't want to be dependent on pesticides. To, uh, like, yeah. Um, yeah, you can show up with your truck and hang on out there. Although, I don't know. You'd be happy that you took it away, huh? Say thank you. This stuff is all we did have some bad deer. Do you still have a compost in your new Potting soil? Yeah, that oh. one. What? You, were, you had one thing that you hadn't sold yet, I thought. Yeah, I've got some spare. Yep. There you go. Yep. Have I'd have to spare. remember uh, what they are after shipping and everything. I think it was... I really like it. It's, 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 uh, it's really good fun. It's really That's why I get it. I mean, it's, it would be a lot more convenient in some ways to go to a supplier and get Berger or something just off the shelf. But um, we've just been really pleased with it. Um, so this is kind of the other end of covered space. So we've got the big heated greenhouse, 32 degrees. And then we've got in here. Now, we haven't covered anything in here yet. Uh, we haven't felt the need to. So we've been down to 23. And you can see we got pretty good survival in there right now. Things still look pretty darn good. We cut out the lettuce last week, so that's not the, the, the lettuce down on the ground is not a symptom of freeze. It's just that we we harvested it. Um, the flowers, I mean, I, I said they look good. The flowers don't look good, but that's because they were summer flowers. We weren't expecting them to go long. Uh, this was just uh, we got some last uh, uh, late sunflowers out of those. And then along the side here, we've got some Napa cabbage. And, um, and those cabbages, so we're talking about successions again. So we put uh, field cabbage out, uh, the Napa cabbage, in and, and, uh, the beginning of August. And then these went in uh, right around the beginning of September, so about a month later. And we found that works really well. Um, one of the advantages of having staggered successions like that is that if you have, um, if you have a really hot September, like we had this year, 
then you're cutting down on the amount of time those crops have to spend in that stress. And that really does help because uh, otherwise you're just you're just fighting an uphill battle the whole fall. And the Ozarks, it's a rough deal. You know, the, the temperatures are too high or too long and then suddenly they're not. And so you've got cabbages, broccoli, and cauliflower that are just just getting the signal to really go crazy and it frosts on them. And, and they won't kill them, but it will slow them well. It depends on how much last year. That's true. Them. Yeah, yeah, because we got down to the hard teens. frost right yeah. away. Yeah. And so uh, oftentimes that becomes kind of one of our limiting factors. But anyway, so, so we talk about, so this is a double layer greenhouse with a furnace in it. So double layer means there's two layers of plastic and there's air blown in between them. Although my blower's broken on this side right now, you can see on the other side it's kind of puffed. But there should be three or four inches of air between those two layers of plastic. And that gives us a little bit of uh, insulation. Um, uh, sorry. That's okay. What does that do for you during the summertime though? Do you have a, don't you have a heating problem? Um, it doesn't make enough difference to matter much. We open up the sides all the way in the summertime. So this side rolls up to about five feet and the other side rolls up to about five feet. We open up these top, we call them demi lune vents, but they're like sort of half moon shape at the top of the arch there. Those flop down. We get a lot of air movement in the summertime. And he uses shade cloth. Yeah, and then we'll put a shade cloth over all of it to kind of temper it. <coughs> so uh, so it, it, when everything's working well in the summertime and there's even a little bit of breeze, it's it can actually be more comfortable in the greenhouse than out of it because it doesn't have, uh, it, it's got shade. And, and, it, and it feels a little bit of breeze. Um, <laughs> I keep finding places where she's dug endlessly, apparently. <laughs> harvesting. Harvesting, yes. That's 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 harvesting the mold crop, I believe. <laughs> well, that would be nice. I mean, Ooh, mold, mold sniffing dogs. Mold there you go. Oh, the oh my gosh. That's true. But they're probably the cats. Probably not the dogs. Um, so here we have this, 32 degrees all the time, right? I mean, no lower than 30, well, really, no lower than like 35. Um, now, over here, this one has no temperature control. It's just solar heat in the daytime. At night, it's going to drop down pretty close to ambient. So, meaning this one, you know, when it was 23 outside, it was probably 24, 25 in there. It's not much difference. Um, and... So why then do we have, you know, healthy Napa cabbage that we haven't had to cover in there, healthy lettuce, whereas out in the open stuff that wasn't covered is now singed? Um, and I wish I could give you an easy answer to that. I have not had anybody know an easy answer to that yet. Well, these guys might want to. Let's, let's move on to this one. Yeah. Better than Tim Faith, right? <laughs> So uh, part of the answer is that there's no wind in there, and that really does seem to make a big difference. Uh, we've noticed that when you when you cut the wind out of the equation, of course that's wind chill, right? And so now your wind chill is just the same as the ambient temperature, which is dramatically different than what you got outside. Um, that seems to make a big difference, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because you've got uh, you know you've got a, a watery plant. Well, any little bit of water that's evaporating out of that is going to kind of depress the, the temperature of that plant even more and so that seems to, to make a difference um, the other thing is it gets much higher daytime temperatures and earlier so we we're talking about that kind of magic 50 degree mark and that's I mentioned that 50 degrees for photosynthesis and that's a little bit arbitrary because there are some plants that can do photosynthesis a little cooler than that but in general that's kind of what we're looking at I mean, 50 degrees an easy benchmark to say if we're above 50 we've probably got plant photosynthesis happening if we're below 50 we probably don't with the exception of a few varieties so that tunnel, you know, will hit 50 degrees on a sunny morning by probably 8.30 in the morning. And the field, it may still be 30. You know, we can still have frost everywhere, and in there, things have just started growing. So that's a big part of it, too, because it's not just the temperature, uh, the, the low temperature, but it's the average temperature over a 24-hour period. So if you raise that average, I mean, that's, that's bringing the average up by a lot to bring that temperature up in, that early in the morning and keep it up. Uh, so that's the... That's when we talk about temperature management, that's one of the things we think about is we're trying to, we're managing so that we get that early morning temperature rise. Now we don't want it to overheat, so we're going to go ahead and vent, like those probably should have been vented a little earlier today, uh, but we don't want it to get over 75 in there or so. Over that tends to um, stress the plants on the other end. You know, they're, another, they're already stressed by being cold, now you jump it up to 80 degrees and they're going, what? I don't know what's going on. 
So you got to give them, you know, we want them to have an easy, slow change. But uh, we do want to get that 50 degrees to happen as early as possible so we can get this, the photosynthesis happening. Do you see an impact on the soil temperature at all? Is it most of the ambient Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. Um, we, we never see our soil, I should say never, but I can't think of any time I've ever seen the soil freeze inside the high tunnel, any of our tunnels, mm -hmm. okay. which, yeah, you know, good. is a marked difference from outside. Um, inside my greenhouse right now, average soil temperature is around 60. Um, in the high tunnels, my guess would be it'd be more around 55. Although it might not be that much different this time of year because we haven't done that much heating in there right now. It's, you know, it's just a little bit different. But, um, but I would guess, you know, we're in the 50s to low 60s out. And, and then in the field, we're probably getting down to low 50s. So, so yeah, it makes a big difference. And that is part of where our growth, you know, is, I mean, part of what's happening growth-wise is happening right at that soil level where you've got the uh, roots, the root zone having enough temperature to be active. Um, and that also applies to biology in the soil, not, you know, not just the plant, but actually the microbes and the fungus and all that stuff is much more active on the soil. Do you actively go around taking soil temperatures in the greenhouses? Not really. I have a uh, thermometer that I keep stuck in the ground in the greenhouse, so I can kind of watch that. Um, Oh, for a couple of years I did that, and I never really found a useful way to use that information. I've got a good friend who uh, checks. You can you can look at. Uh, um, I think it's a Department of Ag website. It might be uh, an MU extension. I'm not sure, but they have a temperature soil monitoring system, and they they keep track of uh, soil temperature, so you can check that pretty easily. And that's what my friend Jason he watches that. Like, talk and he he pays a lot of attention to that i that's probably one of those things that what i would do well to like learn more about that but but he always and i just text jason jason <laughs> yeah uh and he's he knows it off the top of his head uh wouldn't you find though that it's pretty microclimatey out here i feel i mean it's it really is different. yeah you got a south facing slope versus a north facing slope you got mulch on it versus not you got um, a tarp you got a, a greenhouse so it's more to me, it's about uh, gaining an understanding of sort of the relative growth rates in different spaces and how much then you have to think about uh, changing your planting dates accordingly based on your end goal. So uh, the head lettuce in there, the, 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 the lettuce that we cut, it's actually not head lettuce, it's leaf lettuce that we cut down and take those leaves. Uh, that was, uh, that went in the ground in September, end of September. Nope, first of October, and um, and that was the that was the first uh, lettuce that we put into a greenhouse this winter, this fall. I should say. Um, before that, everything goes out in the open, and so what we have to do then when we do that is think about we don't want to put our normal succession on lettuce would be about every two weeks, but if we do that in the fall, we end up with big gaps because you plant in two weeks and then because of the slowing growth rate the difference extends quite a bit. So we plant in our field, we start going down to one week intervals. We plant this one this week and the next next week and so on. And then, but when we do the greenhouse, we back that up to, we let that one go for two weeks because now we've got the field stuff. If we don't, the greenhouse stuff will catch up and pass the, the field stuff. And that's not, that's not our purpose, right? We want to be, so we can leave, uh, in this case, we had ginger growing in that bed. So we're able to leave the ginger in later and keep harvesting it a little longer before we um, had to pull it all out to get the lettuce. So, uh, it does at times feel like a giant logistical puzzle, thinking about where all these things belong and, and when they when they need to be there. And that kind of She's stuff. great. Okay. If you have, you know, uh, any call with the guy upstairs of what the weather's going to be like, that would be helpful too. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. If I, I mean, I would just, I would just settle for being informed. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need just to have influence. I just want I just right. want to know what's happening. Right. Uh, yeah. No. No. I don't think I have. Although I will say, um, you know, having been here for 15 years now, um, and really having grown up in the Ozarks, although not watching the weather like I do now, um, it's somewhat of a comfort to be able to say, okay, yeah, this is a warm, unusually warm fall. Just to know that. People used to ask me about the influence. Like I was a, when I was a, a really beginning grower. I mean, five years in. People would say, now tell us about the impact of climate change on your farming. And I'd be like, hey, I, don't, 
I've been farming five years. I, if it's changing, I couldn't tell you. And I don't, you know, I'm totally unqualified. And, and you know, what they were looking for was, was just a sound bite. But, um, but what I've realized is, you know, for any individual without really having data to try and make assertions like that, it's kind of, it's a lot of hubris. Um, now I've got friends who have you know, been farming for 40 years. And when they tell me, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, we get bigger and, and longer storms now than we had in the past. Well, I listen to that. that. That sounds like anecdotal stuff that makes sense. I mean, like it, it's the sort of thing they would notice versus like, I couldn't tell you how many inches it rained last year off the top of my head. I mean, I know on average the Ozarks received 40. I know we were a little over average, but I don't know what it was. Same thing this year. We were above average most of the year. I think we've probably fallen back down to around average now, but but uh, you know, unless you got a brain that works that way, I don't know see how that would. Yeah. Um, I must ask about the figs because we have figs mm -hmm. and um, we are crazy about covering them in the winter. And obviously, yours are sitting here. So, <laughs> how do you handle figs? Are yeah. they are they just are they the they way they're right going to be? Back to the ground. Yeah. Well, I'll cut them off. <laughs> okay. um, I'll cut them down to the ground. Okay. And when I do that, I will likely put some extra mulch on top of them because okay. you know, we've already discussed that I have. Yeah. Here, so uh, when, when, the, when the opportunity comes up, I pretty much add mulch. Um, but yeah, these will be, uh, this was the best figure we've ever had. I would not look at this as a model of fig production. Um, not, not a successful model, we'll say. But I did have, uh, we had more figs this year than we ever had. So, He's got this figury right here. Yeah, we can look in the figury. Oh, wow. You got a figury? We got a figury. So, put it the ground and mulch it. I mean, that's what I do. Now, the problem is, you miss your first, your first uh, planting that way, you know. I mean, sorry, your first planting, your fruit, first fruit. Oh so the Brava crop comes on early. Yeah. You can smell it. <laughs> so these guys got waxed. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Is that because it wasn't closed up, or? No, it just got cold enough. But... Just got cold enough? Yeah, they don't want to. Nick is going to make a big jam out of them, so we'll see by the time that goes. Oh, it smells so good in here. Now, do you open this tunnel up in the winter in the summer? Uh huh. Yeah, totally raise up. Are things new for you guys? See all the way through. No, the figury is. This is like the first summer it really produced. Okay. So this is new. But we have the monster fig tree that's been there forever. Cool. And we're changing our game plan and trying to. Nice. But not new overall. Yeah. 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 Putting them in the greenhouse. Experiment. Yeah, I thought I'd get a lot more out of them. I, I did get a lot more out of them, I think. That locked from the outside. Nope. It tricked us. <laughs> but yeah, um, these figs, you know, continue to be productive. Well, they start out earlier because they're in a tunnel, so they start growing a lot sooner. And then they started making fruit about a month before the ones in the field. And um, then they were able to make fruit for another three or four weeks after the others had quit. So, I don't know. I'm not really sure that figs make sense economically. I'm not, I do not hold this up as the next great uh, economic boon for Ozarks farmers. I just think it's kind of fun. I, I think it's a fun thing for like mm -hmm. us who are just doing it for ourselves to have mm -hmm. some fruit to eat. I agree. But they don't have a good shelf life, so I don't mm -hmm. think they're a great product for we take market. them to market yeah and we sell everything we can grow uh and one week we took 54 quarts uh, 54 pints 
of, uh, of figs to market. That was the big burst. It was like uh, bigger than we ever harvested before or after. 54 of them. And, um, and they, uh, we sold those for five bucks a pint. So that's probably not terrible, but at the same time, that's a lot of square footage to tie up for that kind of money. And so if we could do that every week, then there'd be no, there'd be no problem. But we're doing that, you know, I think the other weeks it was about half that. So, yeah, we'll to, we've got to pencil it out this fall and see if it actually makes sense. Uh, the plus side is there's very little maintenance to the fig house. It's basically cut them down in the fall. They, they grow in the spring. We get a little bit of extra crop space in there. So we'll grow a couple of batches of uh, radishes or had lettuce or something in, down the middle of the beds um, in the in the winter time, and then by April the figs will take that over and start really growing vigorously, and um, and then we pick them, you know. So there's not we tipped them in September, so there's not other than that there wasn't a lot of effort to them. So I appreciate that part of it versus like a tomato crop where you're just in there all the time messing with it, or flowers you have to pick them every day or every other day. Um, I appreciate that, but I don't know. We'll see. Check with me in three years. <laughs> yeah. Totally Unheated light. though, right? Unheated. Entirely. Yeah. Yeah, we've never heated that one at all. Although it's, it would be, I mean, it would be the next obvious one to heat in terms of location to proximity to power. Um, I actually have a wood burning furnace that would sit there very nicely and just pipe the heat in. So we might mess with it. <laughs> the future, but um, Wood heat's not as much fun as it sounds like when you see I mean, we've always heated our house with wood, and I love mm -hmm. wood. But, um, you know, getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to feed the wood burning furnace in the greenhouse got old years ago. We still do it. We have a, we don't do that. We do, we, we heat. What we do now is we heat with firewood. Um, we'll start a fire at 6 p.m., we'll feed it at 10 before bed. I'm talking about a, in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm, in this furnace. Big firebox, and we'll stuff it full. And then it'll burn down, and about you three or four in the morning, the propane will turn on and kind of keep things warm until I get in in the morning. I usually am up and out around 5.30 or so, and I'll come down and chuck some wood in. Um, and I like that. That's nice. That way I sleep through the night without mm -hmm. thinking about the stove um, or the furnace. And we take turns. Um, Sarah will often feed it at night. She's a, she's a night owl. So I'm, I usually fall asleep about 8.30 and then crawl into bed about 10, but I'm in, the, I'm in a lounge chair somewhere <laughs> sleeping at 8. And um, and then we've got uh, other interns who live on farms, so we'll take turns feeding the furnace. So it's only a you know a, a every third night or so per person, probably. But still, it's a, you know one more thing to do and one more thing to hassle with. So the propane's nice. It costs us a, an extra about a thousand dollars a year to to do that propane for those morning hours. It's money well spent. So many Just nights of sleep. One, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I've got friends who grow greenhouse to, uh, tomatoes, and they'll spend uh, a couple hundred dollars a night on propane. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's scary. It's scary. You get, they, by the time the, um, by the time tomato season rolls around for them, I mean, they plant in December, and by the time they start picking tomatoes in, around the first of March, um, they've already got $10,000 in propane expenses. Wow. Uh, that's terrifying. I, I think that's you know one one rip in your plastic and your ten thousand dollars down the down the hole. You got nothing to show for it. So we just don't do that. Just to get a jump on the tomato. Product. I mean, they've got a great market. You know, they can sell all the tomatoes they want from March until May, and right. and there's it's it, economically it it pencils out, but it's so risky. I don't like the risk aspect of it, and I like sleeping well at night. And they don't sleep well. I mean, they, <laughs> even with those big propane heaters, they just they sleep with that alarm right by them, and I mean, they, they are ready to jump out of bed to go save their investment. My investment's head lettuce. So it's not. It won't mind if it gets down to 25. It, yeah. you know, it might get a little singed, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be saleable. Um, tomatoes at 25. You just toast. It. Well, really, even tomatoes at like 30. Anything below 32, they're dead. And if you get below 40, you start losing fruit, and it's just it's just kind of. A, Anyway, let's let's walk out this way a little more. And um, uh, what were you going to ask? Uh, I was just going to say you're kind of solarizing here, uh -huh. weed killing. Or? So we would call this occultation. So what we're doing is blocking out the light. And what that does is uh, it's killing 
almost everything underneath it. Sure. And decomposing it. So when we covered this over, it was significant weeds. It was a pretty big weedy bed. And uh, you can see there's a little bit of organic matter left on the surface. You can see the, the uh, centipedes and the crickets and roly polies and worms working it over. Looks like a hole too, I think. Holes, um, but this is ready to plant again. You know, all we, all we gotta do is peel the tarp off and then just run the cedar in or run the transplanter through or transplant whatever we're gonna do. And it'll be ready. So that's the goal of these, these tarps. Is these, tar these are covering the uh, early carrot beds. So that we'll seed these in February and March. Direct seed? Mm hmm. Direct seed them. Do you keep them covered after you seed them? No, we'll pull, uh, we'll, we'll put uh, floating row cover on. But not, uh, not the, not the tarp. It varies. So this time of year, it's pretty long. It can be as long as uh, uh, we may we may leave the tarp on for two or three months at this point. In the summertime, three or four weeks is plenty, and it, it decomposes. It's a great practice. It's, it's like a, it's like putting your your, uh, your bed prep on autopilot. You just cover with the tarp and then pour it. It hasn't gotten too hot. That's the one thing that will stop it is it cooks and, and uh, the high um, If it cooks and gets uh, too hot, then it'll dry off, and then it then just goes into suspended animation, so to speak. But in the, and as long as it stays moist, you got lots of uh, fungal and bacterial action happening under there, and, and it works really well. Um, I want you to notice this is a rhubarb. So rhubarb is a little bit frost tolerant, but you can see it got hammered. We're gonna look at some rhubarb out here that's been covered with frost cover to see the difference. Do you do winter cover crops? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, What's your, your plant of taste? Here I've got hen bit and uh, dead. <laughs> oh wait, no. Um, I've got a lot of rye out this fall. Rye is one of my favorites, um, partly because it grows so well under really cold conditions. So, I've, you know, rye never dies out. It always makes it through the winter. And rye and winter wheat are they're the last green things. They really never, never turn brown. We don't like that. Um, we do sometimes mix cheese into the rye. I like that as well. Um, so this tunnel is another unheated greenhouse, unheated, unheated high tunnel. Before you switch gears. What? Daikon. Oh well, yeah, we put daikon in our house as well, oftentimes. I like what that does for our soil. It really uh, opens up the soil, gets you big deep holes into the soil. And um, the, so that when I think about winter cover crops, the important thing to consider is what am I going to do with that bed in the spring? And so if I need that bed early, then I'll probably tarp it rather than cover it up. If I need that bed sometime sort of mid-spring, like say April, then oats might be a good solution. Because oats will start strong, they'll, if you get them in the ground in September, they'll grow a nice cover, but then they'll die around 10 degrees. So we pretty much always kill off our oats. And so then you're just starting with a little straw in the cover, which is nice. And the surface was nice. So easy to rake that off or even plant into it. Um, and then if I'm doing like tomatoes or sweet potatoes, then I may let the rye, may put rye in because then that stuff's going to grow all winter and then in the spring it'll really take off. And by, by the, um, you know, by the middle of April, I've got rye hip high and it'll go all the way to six or seven feet tall um, in, in May and early June. And then it, it'll make seeds. And so I, my, ideally what we do is we, we knock it down uh, before it makes seeds. So, uh, there's, uh, I don't know, are you familiar with the stages of grain? You've got like milk stage and dough and then hard. So uh, milk is where we're trying to go. So it's very early. There's not really, there's no viable seeds. Uh, but when you press the seeds, they, they kind of get a little bit milky and kind of juice in there. And so if you knock the rye down at that point, it dies. Um, before that, you knock it down, it just keeps growing. I mean, it'll, it'll be horizontal, but it'll still grow. Um, so that's part of figuring this thing out is, is thinking about when, what's my time frame, when am I trying to plant? So for example, the rye is really nice for tomato crops. 
because I could go out there and get a really nice rye cover crop going um, this time of year and then roll it down or knock it down in May and either plant the tomatoes directly into it or you know I may chop it or something but usually I just just knock it down and then plant the tomatoes right in, on top of it or in, in, into the, the bed um, whereas if I'm doing uh, lettuce you know depending on which lettuce it is I may put oats or I may just put tar because I'm going to be able to lettuce them really early so that's that's how I'm thinking about cover crops um, this this tunnel was okay so you can see we still got snapdragons cranking along and we were a little bit surprised they look as good as they do we really thought they would be down after this last drop uh, but they're still, still doing pretty well it's pretty hard to snap this week I think um, a lot of that um, this is a this is our uh, our, uh, our bell peppers, and you can see right at the end we had a little bit of damage, and in places where the row cover was touching. So this kind of starts here's where you start to understand more about the floating row cover, right? So if it's touching something, that point is going to have frost. Uh, but then in here, you know, it didn't get affected at all. Um, this is not frost related at all. I don't know what that is. Some sort of horrible disease thing. That's a buggy thing. Yeah. That may be a buggy thing, and then a yeah, I'm not sure what's yeah. But then look, see this 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 circular patterns. Yeah. That's characteristic virus. So this is probably um, uh, tobacco mosaic virus would be my guess. It's, that circles. There's a couple of those uh, mosaic viruses, but because, mosaic because it looks like a mosaic. Um, so, but you, so these did really well under here, and they did better than some of our other things under cover. Um, part of the reason they did that is because this big cover is more effective than a small cover. You're, when you put a cover on, what you're doing is you're helping capture some of the heat from the soil. So, you know, as, as the temperature drops, the, the soil's radiating heat, and it's going to, um, if you don't have something like this to stop it, then that radiated heat's just going to keep going. If you have something like this, it helps slow that radiation down and the convection as well, and so you're trapping more heat. Well, the bigger your cover, the more effective that is. So you know, the bigger the high tunnel, the more temperature stability you get, and then the bigger the, the cover underneath, the more temperature stability you get. Would you do the same with uh, snaps? Yeah. You'd if we them? cared enough about them, we would cover them. Uh, <laughs> I asked Kimmy if she wanted me to cover them, and she said, if they die, I, I don't have to pick them anymore. <laughs> right. yeah, that's, that's brutal. But yeah, okay. You get frostness in the tunnel, do you? <laughs> not, not, not enough yet. So she has uh, she has been slowing down on picking them, but they um, uh, we really expected them to get whacked there at 23 degrees. I'm, I'm astonished at how well they how well they've done. So. And, and you can see, I mean, you know, here's the, some mulberry seedling we. I mean, it got singed, all the gallon soga is dead, the sweet potato vines are dead. It definitely got cold in there, but uh, it didn't get the snaps. And the, I should say, too, I mean, we've been harvesting off these snaps for two months, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, we've, we've got our share off. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good. But, um, okay, so let's, let's, I told you I'd talk a little bit about ventilation, uh, uh, temperature control. We talked a little about temperature already, so that's what's going on here, right? So we got first layer of temperature control is the greenhouse itself or the high tunnel. Um, this is another blown greenhouse, so it's got two layers of plastic, that little blower right there. It's, it's uh, putting air between the layers, and that's why it kind of looks, uh, on this side, it's kind of quilted, and on the outside, it's one smooth surface. There's about this much air between those two surfaces, and it really makes quite a difference. Um, in the, in the uh, wintertime, the real cold temperatures, the, the, te the greenhouses that have a double layer uh, tend to be, you know, something like five degrees warmer than the ones with a single layer. So that's a pretty significant difference. Yeah. It's also structural. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. So they they don't flap as much, and flapping is what tears things up, right? It's, it's like a force. Uh, uh, it's a force force a multiplier. So if things never get a chance to work up that momentum, then you don't get as many fast fasteners pulling loose, as many uh, bolts loosening, and even plastic doesn't rip, and so on. And on the outside, when it snows, the snow is going to come off of it better right. than what if it was concave. Yeah, because a couple times we've had the snow when the when we get a power outage, it's kind of spooky because then you get snow building up in those uh, divots and on the structure and so on. And so as long as, it, as long as it doesn't snow too heavy, too fast, it's the inflation keeps that snow sliding off. Hmm. Have you found a like a best shape 
four years truck just helped snow and uh, yeah this is not it but this is a, this is a good strong stuff uh, this is a good strong structure i mean these are better than the old style a lot of the early high tunnels were just half circles um well, like our like our caterpillar tunnel or kitten tunnel that we just looked at and the, the advantage of that is it's really easy to build. I mean, you can bend those hoops yourself super easy. But the higher your walls get, the harder that gets to build, and also uh, the less structurally sound it becomes. So this is a much bigger pipe than those, and also has a truss, uh, just one single truss, uh, uh, cross, feet, cross brace in the, uh, above there. And these, I don't worry too much about this in snow. I mean, I, I, haven't, I have one friend who's ever had one collapse, and she didn't have those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and she also had uh, 18 inches of heavy snow. Liz Grazenack had one collapse her first year. Um, first year she owned it. But it was like one of those freak storms that just, I mean, fr freak from Missouri where, and she's in, in a valley where there's just no wind at all, so it just all settled on her structure. Um, for us, it's so rare that we get any significant snow buildup on these. I, I don't worry that much. Uh, so we've got temperature control with the plastic a little extra temperature because we've got this this blown layer um, and then we've got a secondary layer and this is this I think is the key more than possibly any other single addition to having really good winter crops these these make a huge difference and they do because it's it's the same idea the best analogy I've ever heard is you know if you're in a in a bed in a cool room and somebody says here let me give you a sheet but they put that sheet six feet over you <laughs> thanks yeah <laughs> a, you, you know um but if that sheet is right on top of you it just captures a lot more heat it keeps the heat closer where you need it and so that's what these secondary covers are about now this one is you know it's pretty unique for this this is really just seasonal to be up on these um, up over the stakes and everything obviously we don't do this all winter long because the peppers will be done here pretty soon um but on lettuce and things well we'll see we'll see the other way we hoop here in a minute but but this is, this is really, really important. So this adds another five to even maybe 10 degrees of frost protection um, when you start putting covers within high tunnels. And the other great thing about them is you don't have to anchor them. There's no, when you just drape them, they stay put. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a love hate It's really good for weed control, right? It's really a pain to plant through. It tends to get grown up on the edges and then, you, then you're like, it's, a, it's really difficult to get out of the ground at the end of the season if you don't have, you know, if it gets weeds on the edges. Um, so, I don't know. We use quite a bit of it. We use a little less of it than we did a couple years ago, but we're not giving it up. Anymore. So, this, this long, I saw here only has the one blower? Yeah, one little blower. Because okay. it's pretty airtight. You know, those, the seam, I mean, ideally, the seam along the edge is very airtight. Right. So, you're, you're not having to move much air. In fact, uh, if you go up to uh, Versailles, uh, in the area around there where there's a lot of Mennonites and, and Amish without power, uh, they, some of them do, uh, it's a wind-powered blower. So they, they take like a four-inch pipe mm -hmm. and a funnel. It's a funnel. It looks like a ship, you know the uh, things that catch air on the ship and send it down below? Mm -hmm. It's that same idea. And the, the theory is, and it works, the harder the wind blows, the more pressure there is pushing air into the plastic. When there's no wind, you don't have as much need for that inflated layer in terms of structure. And so the higher the wind blows, the more pressure there is inside pushing back. So, but you can see how it works. It's, yeah. it's totally smooth. So this is an example of outside coverage. Now, and this is, this is such a great example. So these are carrots. Uh, we've got some turnips over here. Um, we put them on hoops. These are wire hoops here. And these are nine gauge wire hoops. We buy them for this purpose. You can buy nine gauge wire and get it cut. Or you can pay the like penny a piece that they charge to cut them for you. You should pay the penny a piece. Good grief. Um, so we buy these up at Morgan County Seed. And this is what our, all of our early production is built around this system. Uh, our early season. Whether it's uh, flowers or, or others. Um, this is how we're getting them started is under a layer like this. Um, we use two different uh, weights of row cover. These are both the heavy ones. This is what's called Ag 34. Uh, I think it's a 1.5 ounce per square yard. Um, but uh, this stuff is great. 
The problem is what you see here. We didn't uncover this. This uncovered itself, right? This is what the wind does. And so all winter long we fight this. It's really, it gets old real, real quick. Um, How's it hold up with the rain and stuff? So it lets rain pass through it. Um, it will collapse in snow. These carrots are like last dish. These are the Hail Mary carrots. <laughs> I'm not really sure we're getting carrots out of these, but you know, aren't they cute? Uh, yeah, this is this is a month away from really nice carrots. So, um. wouldn't that be like uh, baby carrot? Yeah, <laughs> baby, baby. Maybe a chef would like them or something. But uh, there you go. Tops are pretty. Yeah. Um. So the snow will will crush them pretty flat. They usually bounce back okay. Um, rain goes through them, so that's not a problem. Um, in fact, sometimes I, I really, if it's going to be windy, it's nice if it's rainy because when they're heavier, they don't flap as much. And you notice that on some crops, we don't hoop. And hey. so our experience has been hey. things, and this is kind of just something we've learned over time, but the turnips don't mind hey. to not be uh, hooped. They do okay with just supporting hey. the, the cover. We hey. put the cover on in part to protect from cold nighttime temperatures, but this time of year also, it gets warmer in here, uh, and we start our thermo, you know start our photosynthesis a little earlier because we're covered like that, and that makes a difference. Um, Still, the would you say Ag thirty four weight? Uh huh. It's a heavier weight. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the kale out here that got got uh, whacked by yeah. the cold. We had a really <laughs> this is the worst bed of kale we've ever grown. Uh, I'm sure the creeping Charlie didn't help anything, but. We seeded it, and what you see is what came up, the little isolated plants. And so we just let it go because there was no point in trying to. You know. But uh, but it is an interesting uh, thing to see that the kale that's out here is dead, and the kale that we'll see in the other tunnels is you know, still really healthy and thriving. Hmm. The key elements for this to work: um, getting it tight on the ends. This is this is a decent example. It would be better if we had tied them and staked it out and get it really nice and tight. Um, Lots of sandbags, lots of hoops, and those are the criteria that you know really make it work or not. Um, whatever the case, you never expect a cover that's in the field to last more than a season. It's just a one season deal. You can already see holes developing in the roots. It's not that durable. You say it's more important to tie it at the end than down the sides? Um, no, I'd say it's both. Both? Yeah, but anything that you can do to keep it tight. Flapping is what breaks things and gets them, um, you know, pulls it loose and so on, tears stuff. So if you can keep it from moving, so it's those, uh, laying out your hoops, staking it out tight, and then spreading the, the uh, row cover and placing the sandbags on it, that's what keeps everything in place. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we mentioned anemones earlier. Um, one of the things we discovered with anemones, which are a cut flower, um, is that they uh, they don't like our big greenhouse because it gets too warm too quick in there. So once you start hitting 80 degrees with any regularity, the anemones uh, just get real short and unhealthy and they stop doing their thing. So, um, so they do better in here because it's a little cooler uh, in the springtime. Uh, the soil temperatures in particular are a little cooler in here. And, uh, but they'll grow like this all through the winter. We should have anemones for Valentine's Day out of here. So that's, that's the typical, um, typical goal. Um, you can see the dahlias are just winding up in here. Um, they actually are still blooming. We cut some last week, but the, the powdery mildew was so bad that we're going to go ahead and take them out. Um, We've got fennel growing in here. We've got these perennial herbs. Um, I'm not totally sure that the perennial herbs make sense, but they're nice to have like Christmas time, um, you know, to cut a bunch of rosemary and sage. That sells pretty well. And, you know, dollars and cents, it probably does work out because every time you cut a bundle off of each of those plants, that's $2.50. Well, you can cut a lot of bundles off of that plant in a year. I mean, that's... And it keeps coming back. And it keeps coming back, so yeah. And they're pretty pest resistant so they, are. So they don't yes. require a lot of no, no we, we pretty much ignore them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now over here we've got kind of the, the, the extreme end of things. We've got turmeric which is a, a true tropical. Um, turmeric is does really well in here in the summertime because it gets so hot and stays so hot. Um, 
And we start that in February in the greenhouse. We transplant in here in April. And then it'll, we'll harvest the last of this probably this week. And uh, maybe, maybe as late as uh, the first week of this year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much almost a year-long process to grow turmeric. Now, we started harvesting our first turmeric at the end of September. Turmeric and ginger are usually the start and end of September. So, so some of it was shorter than that. But it takes a long time to sprout. Tropical, so it's got a very long season. People buy the fresh turmeric, is that right? $20 a pound. Yeah. So this bed will produce about 20 pounds of turmeric, maybe a little less than that. And so we have a $400 per summer bed, which is pretty good. 20 foot wide, uh, 20 foot long, 3 foot wide, so 60 square feet. Um, $200, um, even if we say 180. So that's uh, $3 a square foot, right? That's a pretty good number. I'd like to be 3 to $4 a square foot per. Uh, in, in our production bed uh, per year, and we will be able to put a crop of arugula or something quick growing in there and cycle it out before we replant with something for the summer next year. So, uh, what do you have in, um, or in terms of sourcing your soil for your raised beds? See, that's a great segue. Let's go see. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm also going to come back to your question about the surrounding environment, too, because that's a that feel on that. But uh, I'm, I'm heavily into most of my soil and stuff that we made on the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Evidently, I'm going to add your brother because he also wants the wood chips. Oh, I, I mean, wood chips. I, I am convinced that 20 years from now, people will say, they used to give them stuff like that. <laughs> because it's, it's that kind of a resource where it's, yeah. uh, it's a, I mean, you're being given carbon and organic matter that took centuries to make and is irreplaceable. You can't, I mean, you can't just go and make wood chips, right? You have to have trees to cut them down. Yeah. You have to them up. Um, and I really think that there was other time when you look at it and go, I can't believe that all that stuff just got given away. Yeah. Our neighbor's a tree guy, so he just dumps it on our property. I mean, you cannot beat it. And, uh, so this is part of our uh, soil system, uh, compost system, really, right? So these guys, what we do is we, we get, you see those big piles over there? Um, that's all wood chips on the far side. Now, the closer stuff, it looks like wood chips, but it's also got a lot of fairgrounds bedding and spent grain and coffee grounds and just a wide variety of, of uh, organic matter. Basically, if somebody will bring it to us, we'll put it in our compost. And there's even a few things we'll go haul, like uh, we get... Uh, Cocoa hulls from Askinosia chocolate every uh, about every year, some yeah about once a year. It's really high nitrogen. It's a great compost ingredient. It's not useful for much of anything else. It's a waste product. I mean, it, mm -hmm. there's yeah. So it works really well for us in that setting, and um, and that all that stuff goes into those windrows. So those windrows, I wish I wish you could see it on a nice cool morning, but you know, cool wet morning, all those windrows are steaming. So their internal temperature is around 120 to 130 degrees. And uh, they will cool off after they sit for a while because they, they'll kind of uh, settle and the air will stop flowing into them. The, the bacteria and the fungus will slow down. Um, but we, we move those windrows into our pig pen. Every three months, we'll move a fresh batch in. And so when it started, this pig pen was you know, six foot tall of, uh, of wood chips and other bedding. And then... Uh, we scraped after three months of adding weeds and uh, you can see rotten daikon here and old pumpkins and leaves and I mean everything we get our hands on we'll, we'll add in here and the pigs I mean, you can see this is, uh, this is uh, bread from neighborhood mill David was just out that's all this stuff is from that truck that came down the drive a minute ago uh, but then all that stuff goes in there the pigs help integrate it into the wood chips and other compost material and then um, then we will <laughs> yeah yeah they do their job you know add add uh, manure and, and urine and, and uh, then they dig and you can see they've dug pits all over the place out through there and they kind of that's what the pigs do for a hobby dig and then we scrape it out and move it out into these windrows over here we can go take a peek and we're experimenting with different things over here but what we what we used to do what we've done for years is just windrow it and kind of ignore it for three months, and then we roll it after three months and let it 
do its thing again for another three minutes. And, and each time we roll it, it heats back up. So it'll get up to about 130 degrees and then it'll gradually taper off. Sometimes even hotter, sometimes it gets to 180, depending on what's in it. And then it'll slow down and so on. Um, and then eventually it arrives at, at this, which this, this looks a little rough on the outside, but if you, you know, the wood chips always kind of, it always looks chippy on the outside because it gets, the, the soil gets, or the, uh, the organic matter gets washed out of it. But this is dry, you know, it's cool now. There's no heat left in this pile. And that's what we're putting in our beds. Nice. Now, in our raised beds, we've actually put just straight wood chips in the bottom of them at times, if we, if we didn't have other stuff. And that's worked good. We can put about, um, as long as we have about three or four inches of pretty good compost on top of that, having a full wood chip bottom works. He's talking um, about the really high raised beds in the greenhouse. Yeah, that's yeah. mm -hmm. why he's asking me about the soil. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so, so we can build beds that way, and that works great. Um, and after a year, you can't tell there are wood chips down there. It's all gone. It's mm -hmm. just beautiful soil. It subsides a lot. You, get, you know, lose mm -hmm. six inches of material, but but it just turns into this beautiful stuff. So now this is cool. This is ready to go out on the field. So this is what's going on the fields now. And uh, we apply this pretty heavily. Uh, for the last several years, we've applied it um, basically eight inches on many of our sites, at many of our beds every third year. So quite a bit, it's a lot. Um, of course, it, again, it, it's gonna subside even more as it decomposes more. And you can tell, I mean, it's not, a, it's not like a, garden center compost. I mean, this stuff is not sifted. In fact, uh, we find all sorts of interesting treats in it, um, including, not limited to, there's a Menard's bag, I think it is. And, you know, that sort of thing is just constant plastic. Mm. Um, and this is because, uh, one, because the wood chip crews, uh, they, they see the chipper as a giant disposal. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the worst thing we ever had in that regard was somebody tossed a styrofoam ice chest through a chipper and then dump those chips on us. And we had styrofoam for Ever. forever, forever, yeah. We still have um, styrofoam. Well, we probably do, I mean, uh, yeah. You know, and we picked a lot of it out, but there's no way, you're just never gonna get something like that. Um, and then a lot of this, where they didn't run through a chipper, but they just chuck mm -hmm. in the truck. And so we end up with this stuff. And then the fairgrounds um, got the same system. You know, you get a lot, of, a lot of cups, a lot of signs, a lot of skull cans, that kind of thing. But I, I figure that's the price of receiving literally mountains i mean that's our that's our chip pile and it's wow it's actually diminished some from its peak and i've got um, two more chip piles that size in different locations on the farm so we have just massive amounts of this stuff um, but that said that's what we're farming with. i mean that's that's what our soil is anymore is decomposed wood chips uh, with as much nitrogen as we can scrounge up but even without the nitrogen over time the wood chips become incredible soil we did early on. Yeah, we used a lot of poultry litter early, and um, uh, my my calcium levels and my pH went up pretty high, and that's why I had to back off of that. Poultry litter is a great material. I mean, it, it does it, it's incredible fertilizer. It does really good things for your soil, but it um, it is nasty to work with. You know, it's really smelly, and I don't like that part of it. Um, and we don't actually have really close poultry. Yeah, yeah, buffalo is kind of a, a yeah, yeah. Okay. I think yeah. that was a clever one. You guys have some closer. So, other than your wood chips and your your finished product here, do you amend? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. with uh, any kind of fertilizer yeah, other bet. than the dairy. Um, I have uh, I have a uh, my favorite for the last several years has been pelletized alfalfa. So the you know the just the same stuff you would feed to rabbits and horses. It's, it's just, they call it alfalfa pellets at, at MFA, and you can pick it up for about $12, a 50-pound bag. We'll put about 30 pounds on a bed, and that supplies nitrogen for pretty much anything I could want to grow in that. It's really a nice source. It's slow release. You can't, you can't burn crops with it. Um, the worms love it, which is always a big, you know, to me, that's a, if the worms come to eat it, that's a good sign. Like you're doing something right when you get lots of worms. We've also found coffee grounds to be very effective. And for a long time, we just said, oh, yeah, but that's not practical. Well, now we're getting like 10 gallons of coffee grounds a week. It starts to look more practical. That's a lot of coffee grounds. So, so we are putting that, in some places we're putting that down underneath mulch or before, like if, like when we did those gladiolas last year. Cardboard, compost, and then a layer of, uh, of, of uh, coffee grounds. And then our, then our bulbs and then our, um, then our mulch on top. And that worked really well. So they, they were really vigorous and green and you know, signs of good nitrogen source. 
Uh, let me show you this other pile because I, 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 I hope you guys enjoy composting as much as I do. Right? This is like a bonus trip. Oh man, <laughs> composting. Compost is so awesome. Nice, magical stuff. So this, what we did here, this came out of the pig pen uh, three months ago. And this is a little different system. We've got a pipe under this one and it's blowing air two minutes an hour. It's off 58 minutes and then it's on for two minutes. And um, so this is what you call a static aerated pile. And I'm really excited about this because what we're doing here is we are getting away from the mechanical need to constantly turn. Um, I don't have a lot of heat right now, but you can see I've got this really nice, I mean, for having only been out of the pig pen for three months, it's starting to look really good, really fast. And that's what we saw last year. We did this last year. And what we're noticing is when we turn it, you're doing some compaction. You know, you just, you can't help but. I mean, if you scoop it up and then drop it, it's doing that. And you're changing the, the texture of it. And it gets kind of like, you know, it gets squished like this. And then it's kind of slimier and more compact and so on. So, but we weren't sure how else to get air into it. And then, um, I got to reading about these static aerated piles and realized that was exactly what I'm looking for. So, so this, uh, the, the you know, advantages again, we're reducing our, our dependence on machinery because now we're just doing this once, wind rolling it once and letting the air do the job. Um, in the past, we would have rolled this pile three times before we would have called it finished compost. Mm -hmm. Last year's static compost experiment uh, was the prettiest compost we've ever made, and we didn't turn it a bit. I mean, it just, it just, it, it, it's just a pipe with holes mm -hmm. in it? Yeah, I'll show you right here. Mm -hmm. Do you have a blower on it? Uh-huh. Two minutes and a half. Pipe, this is solid here, but once right. it gets into the pile, it's that perforated pipe. It's got sets of holes. So I think it's a hole about every foot. And it's bell in, so it all fits together real nice. And when you take the pile apart, you just start from the end and start scooping. You try and keep it, you know, higher than the pipe. And then as you get, say, 10 feet in, you kind of very gently scrape it off, and you can see the pipe there, and you just pull it out one 10-foot section at a time. It'll work pretty well. And um, we did lay down a bed of chips first, so that kind of gives the, the whole pile something to sit on. It kind of allows a little extra airflow there. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty fascinating system, and I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it, I've always had some objections to the turning system because that's not how nature does it. Like, there's, there's no place in nature where compost gets turned every three months you know, or even two weeks or whatever. It does speed up the decomposition process. You can, you can crank some compost out in a hurry by turning. But it's so much energy use and so much effort every time we do it. I mean, this is, you know, a pile like this takes you six hours to turn, even with the skid steer. It's a, maybe three hours. It's a long process. A lot of diesel fuel burned up doing it. Plus, you got to have all that much space. You know, it's just one problem after another. So I really like this. I'm excited about this. I think it'll, I think it'll make a huge difference for us in terms of uh, our ability to compost uh, reliably and, um, and get a really high quality product too. Because what we got out of it last year was, uh, the, the difference to me was, you know, so if you have, uh, if you have wood chips and something you're turning all the time, eventually those wood chips kind of get compacted down into like wood flakes. They get small and they rot, but they kind of get flaked. In this, they still had the size of the wood chip, but they were just completely porous like a sponge. Mm -hmm. That's perfect to me. That's exactly what I want to see. I want to see something that, that looks like it can, hold and release water over time you know so is so that's it yeah. is the pipe close to the ground or is mm -hmm. it kind of in it's the on the ground the... the whole way down oh okay. Mm -hmm. okay so the idea is that the air is just kind of percolating up through the okay. up through the structure and obviously i mean we could you could build it to scale oh yeah 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 people do it on a pallet scale people yeah. do it i mean there's some really cool stuff in fact there's a thing called a um johnson sioux bioreactor but it's a, a pallet scaled compost pile that's supposed to produce some extremely high quality compost. And it was one of the inspirations for me turning to the static aerated system was looking at what Johnson Sioux was doing going, that 
is that makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, having spent a lot of time composting, um, it, it had all the ch characteristics I wanted to see. I, I believe in the value of aeration. I, I know people who do st static piles that are never aerated, and they just dig into it after years and years, and they get good compost. But it takes a long time that way. And, uh, and I don't have forever. I mean, I've got this much material to move through annually. Like, this, this is just this year's material, you know. So I, I got a lot of stuff I got to keep rolling through the system. Um, and we do some sheet composting as well. We just take these materials out and just spread them in the field. Uh, we do some where we'll wind roll them and let them sit for longer periods of time out in other places on the farm. But, but I like to keep things moving through fairly well because we have a constant demand. So um, Anyway, Johnson Sioux was, a, was an interesting aspect Johnson. of that. Johnson Sioux. S-U. S-U. Mm -hmm. S-U. Yeah. And I think he's, uh, he and his wife, and they may both be professors, I'm not sure. They're, I think they're professors of uh, uh, biology in, um, in New Mexico or something. So, but they have these, they kind of came up with this system that's very farmer friendly, that produces this in, in incredibly microbially diverse and uh, useful compost. And so that's, that's kind of what we're aiming for nowadays. So. Yeah, it definitely saved you a lot of money and manpower. Oh, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we still, you know, as long as we're using the pigs, we still have that every three months, using machinery to scrape that out. And I really like having the pigs involved in our compost. I don't see giving that up anytime soon. Plus, the pigs themselves are profitable, so it makes sense. But, you know, this, when I pull this one out, it's going to go right there on top of a piece of pipe, and I'm going to make that a static aerated pile as well, and I'm just going to keep doing that with these three piles, and that should basically get me on a, on a schedule that will keep good compost available to us at all times and also not... Uh, not add labor to our, I mean, the last thing we need to do is come up with busy work, right? So I love that we can do more by doing nothing. We're doing, do more by doing less. There you go. Do less by doing, I don't know, anyway, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a timer and a blower and a pipe, piece yeah, of pipe, you know, it's a pretty crazy. simple technology. Uh, the timer, by the way, I bought off of Amazon. It's uh, what they call an interval timer. So it's a uh, near pal is the brand, N-E-A-R-C-O-W. But it just, yeah, it's got 47 minutes left, 46 minutes left, so it'll go off, it'll go off in two minutes. And that timer will do a whole lot of things. All it does for me is turn on the timer. <laughs> but you can set it for all sorts of different animals. And you do a lot of your own building and designing. And yeah, I think, you know, I think farmers are generally tinkerers. Yeah. Um, now, I've known farmers who are not uh, not construction tinkerers, not plumbers and things like that. Uh, but I think the nature of farming is such that it's, it's always innovation. If you're not innovating, you're probably dying, you know, you've got to mm -hmm. figure out. I mean, even if the innovation is just how to, I mean, sometimes it's a better lap than right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's a better system. And sometimes innovation is really about stealing other people's ideas. We These latches that we're doing now, which... Uh, a really simple piece of rod bent in a fun shape. You know? We didn't know what we were doing when we built our first greenhouse latches, and so they were always coming undone. They were sliders. You can see the old hole where there was a slider. Yeah. It seemed like a really good idea when we started, and then we realized like it's so so it has to be aligned just so for it to work every time. And these are much more um, forgiving. forgiving. Yeah. So you know this. There's a whole wide range of conditions under which this works. <laughs> All the conditions that we found so far. I like it. But this was a... Uh... Can we go in there? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to turn the water off. <laughs> How about if we turn the water off? Oh, come on. Are you recording? what crops are growing where and also yeah to expose it to the rain flush out the system um, you're going to have less pests because you don't have it all in the tunnel all the time uh, so the, the tunnel's built on skids and so they're just 
once he pops it up, then we can pull it forward. So this is a non-heated tunnel. Yep. Well, we use propane. Um, yeah. oh, you so in the spring, it, really cool. when we put our tomatoes in, so these cherry tomatoes that are now post, uh, came, we put these in here in March, uh, mid-March, and so then for the first month, I've got two big propane heaters that I keep in here as backup. I don't heat it any hotter than, than basically freezing temperature, but I don't want to lose them, you know, it's my insurance policy. So some years, like this year, oh, I think we burned those, those heaters maybe three nights. I mean, it wasn't much. Um, 2020, we burned them for like two weeks straight. <laughs> it's a lot more propane. But even at that, you're looking at maybe $200 worth of propane. And that's easily recouped the first time you pick tomatoes in the first of May. You know, that's just a, a no-brainer. I mean, to the degree that I've actually considered putting real heaters in here, I, I thought that, that might make sense. It might make financial sense. But uh, so far, I'm pretty happy with just putting those big propane torpedoes in and not thinking about it much. Um, but anyway, these, yeah, so these guys, uh, these tomatoes are done, but they produced, you know, until last week, um, since they, they, we picked the first tomatoes off of them the 1st of May, and, uh, as of the 1st of August, all this was tomatoes, and we just kind of gradually yanked beds. As they, as they got more disease or, you know, a little less vigorous, we would yank one row and stick some fall crops in, and so on. So we've got, uh, scallions. Which is just a fancy word for green onions. Um, carrots. These will be our very early spring carrots. So these carrots should we should be able to harvest these carrots in March or so, mid March. Um, lettuce and bok choy. Caterpillars, apparently. Healthy <laughs> growth caterpillars somewhere. Very well um, fed caterpillars. Very, very organic caterpillars. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to eat them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> Chard, chard uh, spinach, and then you know, these will come out next week. We'll turn the beds over. I think our next crop on those, uh, those are going to be probably head lettuce, I would say, for uh, February harvest. And, and this will come out, this should come out by Christmas, and it'll turn over. I don't know for sure what we'll put in there. Um, It'll depend on what we have on the seedling table and or you know what we see a need for but there's this constant dance in there this will be here all winter and you can see the row cover here um, we're not going to pull it because it's wet but it was just draped and that's again one of the huge advantages of having a tunnel is we don't have to anchor this we don't have to hoop it right we just pull it on it's just like flying it's so nice um, so again with because you got greens here, so they're mm -hmm. going to look for a lot of nitrogen, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's just the pelletized. This is alfalfa in here, yeah. Alfalfa. Heavy, pretty heavy on the alfalfa. This is, um, uh, is it 30, 30 to even 40 pounds per bed in here. And we didn't fertilize after the tomatoes in here, because the tomatoes get tons of nitrogen. Um, they get alfalfa pellets, and then they'll also get some, um, some soybean meal in the spring and um, we put a little bit of feather meal on these this year as well. I like having a diverse uh, array of, of um, soil additions because then I feel like that's just, that makes sense. You know, the more, the more, the bigger the buffet you offer those microbes, then the better job they can do of supporting your plants and, and vice versa. So, yeah. And the spinach, we just picked it yesterday. It took a long time to take off, but it's looking really good right now. It needs a weeding. Other than that, the quality is very high. We had great big leaves and gorgeous leaves off of this. Um, but this is so. This is the classic system, though, right? We got the, we got the tunnel. We've got the uh, the, the interior cover. Now uh, ventilation. We were going to talk about that a little bit. So when it's above 40 degrees outside, I will usually be venting tunnels to some degree, and that's because uh, moisture is not our friend in the winter time. Uh, it causes all sorts of fungal problems. It uh, It'll cause your plants to rot. Um, so we want to keep a fairly... So what we do is like this. I was just watering this because we know we got a nice warm day today and tomorrow. And so tomorrow should dry out nicely before it gets real cold tomorrow night. Take a golf cart ride. Um, so we water deeply. And this was water. This water for about four hours. And I want to water real deeply and let that water soak in deep, really replenish the deep soil, and then let the surface dry back out before I have to close the whole space up. So that's what we're always hoping to do in the winter high tunnels 
is to water when we've got nice warm weather and then let it uh, dry out as much as possible, you know, without sacrificing growth in the, in the winter time. And um, so how do I know when it's too wet? Well, one indicator that it's too wet is if I'm getting a lot of condensation in the mornings in here, I'm starting to run a little wetter than I'd like to be. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tools we have in our, in our to support that is these plastic row covers or our bed covers, mm -hmm. half covers, I mean. And uh, we've got a couple more to put out yet. Yeah, we've got one over there and one over here. Uh, but these, what these help us do is actually keeps the moisture in the soil. So rather than evaporating up, we've now cut the amount of water that can evaporate up about about half by covering the paths. Um, another tool we have at our disposal is that water timing, and then the biggest one is just ventilation. So we open them when we can, we close them when we need to, uh, but in general, above 40 or 45 degrees, we're going to open up the sides and let the let air move through, uh, especially if we can get that 60 degrees in here. We'd like to keep about 60 in here and let that air exchange. Uh, so we don't open them all the way, we let them with, open them you know, as much as it seems prudent to do. Um, and then we'll close them up most nights, because we do want to keep that separate. Unless the temperature, you know, if it's going to be above 40 at night, then I'll leave it open, but, but oh. anything below 40 will close them up. There's a lot of labor in that. That's the downside of this system is it's, I mean, if we're in the, we're in the middle of January, we don't always have to come in and pull the row covers off, but crops do grow better without, you know, there's sunlight is our limiting factor, and of course this is blocking, you know, 15 to 20% of your sunlight, so you're going to slow down growth by keeping it covered all the time. Um, at the same time, it needs to get covered at night so you don't get too cold, so it's, in January, it can be a daily process to come in, uncover the crops, and then come back about four o'clock and recover the crops. We've got timers to go off to remind us to do that. Yeah. Well, plus you don't want to lose your, your new tomatoes coming in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You can always tell where the tomatoes grew the year before. Can't you? Yeah. Yeah. There's some tomatoes coming up in the spinach. Wow. Well. Yep. We'll head back up there. You want this door open? Um, actually, we should roll up the side. Roll up the side? Yeah, roll it up. I think it's going to be not real cold tonight. Are you walking back up? Yeah, so we'll walk around that way. Okay. Um, but that's kind of like brand new, though, isn't it? I mean, last time I was here. Uh, no, I uh, mean, let's see. We've rearranged things a bit, but we haven't really added or subtracted to our growing space much for a couple of years. We have built a couple more tunnels. Um, we keep adding them. Uh, oh my gosh. Hi, beauty. Dogs help a lot with the deer. Now, I have not had a good rabbit dog for a number of years, and I, I rabbit hunt pretty aggressively in season, um, like every night. So, um, and that makes a difference. But that's a, it's a problem. I mean, they're, they're just kind of a constant presence. I have, I have several grower friends who have gone ahead and set up the big deer fence. Mm -hmm. Eight-foot deer fence around the whole farm, and they say it's amazing. It pays for itself its first year. They usually say they were losing you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of produce a year. Exactly, right? <laughs> they're very rude about that. Yeah. Um, maybe they're friendly. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I know. And um, you know, you can get deer predation permits, but I've talked to the conservation department, and I, I think they're probably right, and say you know. We'll give you a permit, but the truth is, there's so many deer, there's no way you're going to beat them back. You know, they're just, they're going to come back. And, uh, I mean, there's just, you're just more waiting, that's what they say, there's just more waiting to, to move into that vacuum that you create when you shoot through the trees. Um, but that said, you know, I do think, so I think what I've learned as well is, so here's one of my deer protectors. Hi, Ruby. <laughs> 
Yeah. Ready to patrol the territory. So this is her schedule. She's asleep all day long, and then she wakes up about four o'clock in the afternoon and goes, "Ready to go hunt something? Let's go see what we can find." Here. And so she roams all night long looking for deer and whatever else with her sister, sister Raven. Um, and that's pretty effective. The downside is they also really like laying in carrot beds and flower beds. <laughs> They're like, oh, that's a bed, right? Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. Use that. Ooh, fresh soil. Especially yeah. a freshly tilled. Oh, man. I mean, you add compost yeah, or something. Yeah, like, better than that. What a treat. <laughs> and you can Whoa. tell in the morning because they're just dirty from head to toe and they look kind of guilty. <laughs> uh, but uh, but they're pretty effective. And um, uh, we've also learned to put the things that are deer prone closer to the house where they'll get more attention and, and more human and dog presence. So, like, if I've got, you know, um, I won't plant sweet potatoes out in the far corner because I know they're just going to get wiped out. If I put them up, it doesn't have to be super close, like even right there between, uh, right behind that little house, my, my father-in-law's house, then that's enough to, to deter the deer enough to get a crop out of it. Now, we just bought five acres over on the other side, and it's, it's, it, you can access it through here, and... Kimby and I were just discussing today what we're going to do with that. We did sunflowers this summer, and we just overwhelmed the deer with sunflowers. There were so many that they didn't, you know, they couldn't possibly eat them all. But they, they did their best. I mean, they they, they cleared like a challenge. Yeah, they cleared probably a uh, you know 30 by 30 section down to the ground of sunflower. Um, out of these, we, each of the beds was each of the plots is uh, 70 by 100. So a significant portion that they managed to clear out. And I'm sure next year they'll be back with their friends. And there's this great sunflower <laughs> smorgasbord, guys. We got a spot. Yeah. So there are, we're going to have to do some stuff out there. And I don't know. We talked about putting up a full-scale deer fence. I hate going through gates. That's the only thing that really holds me back. I, I don't like opening and closing gates. I got out of livestock farming in part because I don't like that. And that would be a necessity with a deer fence. And then the other thing I don't like about them is just the aesthetics. They're It feels like, yeah. It, yeah, it starts to feel like a prison real quick. And I mean, I know that it's just defensive, but uh, who wants that in the backyard? So I haven't figured that out yet. Now I, I'm going to play around next year. I think we've got a big plot out there. We'd like to put sweet potatoes in. Uh, it'd be really good for the sweet potatoes. I just don't know about the deer pressure. So we're going to try the two dimen or three dimensional deer fence this next year. What they do is you put a, a four foot, uh, two or three strand electric fence and then another one back, I think it's four feet back, that's only two feet tall. I don't fully understand why that works, but they say it works pretty well. It's something like that, yeah, yeah, it is something like that, like they just can't negotiate that gap. The multiple layers. Scared me. We visited about how we grow in the cold weather uh, all year round. Our farm produces food 50 weeks out of the year and we do that by paying close attention to our ventilation, to our water use and, and controlling water on the leaves and also uh, to our temperature control. Whether that's passive solar uh, with, in our high tunnels or whether it's active in our greenhouse with our wood furnace and propane furnace. So I hope you've gotten something out of this. Thanks for joining us on this farm walk today. And if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. We'd love to talk with you.